Well, good Sabbath, everyone. It is a good Sabbath. We're above ground. We have the Lord in our heart. We're getting a chance to fellowship with other fellow believers, other Sabbatarians. So good to be here with you. Today's sermon is based on a series that was written by Pastor Fred Seigel. And I want to talk to you today about being robbed of your joy. Now, to some today, the term or phrase Christian joy is an oxymoron. In their mind, these two words contradict each other. Why? Well, I think the main reason is because that's the way many Christians present themselves to the world. They walk around with sour faces. They're grumpy. They seldom smile. They look like they've been baptized in vinegar. And to these people, Christianity isn't something to enjoy, but simply to endure. On the other hand, there are those of us who want so much to enjoy their Christian lives, but are having a hard time doing it because they've allowed certain thieves to steal their joy. They have been victims of joy robbers. Now Paul in the book of Philippians writes about these thieves and he shows us how to fight them. The key verse is from the book of Philippians is found in chapter 4 and verse 4 where he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say... <laughs> Way to go, Aaron. So what's Paul saying here? He's saying to be joyful regardless of our circumstances, no matter what happens and no matter where we are, at home, at work, at school, and yes, even rejoice in church. Now over the last three sermons, we've talked about three famous joy robbers. You can see their pictures at the post office. Uh, one of them is the joy robber called Circumstances. Another one is People. And the last one is Past. But today I want to talk about one of the most famous joy robbers of all time by the name of Stress. He also has an alias he uses called Anxiety. When he wants to hide his activities, he calls himself anxiety. Speaking of stress, have you ever had one of those days when absolutely nothing goes right? You hit what you thought was a snooze button on your alarm clock only to find out you turned it off. And when you finally woke up and looked at the clock, you'll now have 15 minutes to get up, get dressed, and get to work on time. Not going to happen. So you grab all your things so you can get dressed in the car. Come on, admit you do it. You run down the stairs and out into the garage only to find you left your car door open all night and the battery is now dead. So you run over to the neighbor's house, still in your pajamas. You get your feet soaked, running through the dewy grass. Knock on the door, wake your neighbor up, who it was their day off and get them to come jump you off so that you can start your car and go tearing out of the neighborhood. Speeding off to work, and the next thing you know, there's a Kmart blue light special in your rearview mirror. <laughs> After you get your ticket, you take off again and turn the corner to go down to where you work, and there's a traffic jam due to construction. And by the time you get to work, you're now nearly an hour late, and the first thing that happens is your boss chews you out for being late. You get past that, you grab yourself your first cup of coffee, and as you sit down, spill it all over you. <laughs> then, just as you're finishing up the report you should have had your boss an hour ago, your computer crashes before you can save it. And just as you're fussing about that, your secretary walks in and hands in her two-week notice and tells you to have a nice day. And uh, then the phone rings and your tax preparer calls to inform you that instead of the $500 refund you thought you would get, you owe the IRS $5,136.84. When you finally arrive from home, arrive home from work, you're ready to unwind and relax. And instead, your neighbor is pounding on the door, holding up the shredded newspaper that your dog chewed up. Your children come in from school screaming, your spouse comes in fussing about that, and when they go to fix supper, the stove has quit working. 
exhausted. After you get the kids in bed, you decide to go to bed early and get a good night's rest. And when you lay down, the bed frame breaks and the mattress falls on the floor. <laughs> now, it is just possible that through all of this, you kept your joy. And trusted in God for the outcome to each of these issues. Yet if I were a betting man, I would bet that you found your joy at some point in the day had been robbed by this character named stress and anxiety. We all have things that go awry each day, don't we? And days like this create so much tension that many times we don't even realize our joy has been stolen until the next day. Now, while the example I shared with you is to the extreme, almost like a I Love Lucy rerun, we all have our share of experiences that can and do produce a lot of stress and anxiety that rob our joy. Interestingly, though, stress is not only produced by negative experiences, but also by positive ones. It was for this reason that Jane Benton hesitated telling her husband that they had won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. She was thrilled when the doorbell rang and they told her that a certified check for $4 million would be arriving in a few days. All of their dreams would finally come true. Now Joe, her husband, was in the hospital recovering from a mass heart attack and the doctor had told her Joe should have no excitement about anything. But now winning the money was such great news, but Donna was... or. Jane was worried that her husband's heart would not be able to take all the stress. So she decided to call her pastor and ask for his advice since he had a, a lot of experience in breaking stressful news to families. So she told the pastor about winning the sweepstakes and of her concern that if she told Joe this, that he would get so excited he might have another heart attack and die. And the pastor said, I think I can help so the pastor went to the hospital and visited Joe in his room where Joe was watching television. And they had a nice chat for a few minutes. And then the pastor leaned over and said, Joe, I've got a problem and I need your advice. Sure, I'll help if I can. I'd be glad to, Joe says. So the preacher took a deep breath and went on. Well, it's this hypothetical situation regarding Christian stewardship. What would a person do, take you for instance... What would you do if all of a sudden you found out you had won $4 million? What would you do with all that money? Well, that's easy, Joe replied. I'd start by giving $2 million of it to the church, whereupon the pastor had a heart attack and dropped dead. <laughs> Seriously, according to medical studies, stress is the number one killer. Stress can be a contributing factor to chronic headaches, back aches, ulcers, nervous disorders, high and high blood pressure, heart disease, and believe it or not, even some forms of cancer. You see, both negative and positive experiences can place the same strains on our body. And of course, stress affects different people differently, depending on how well that person is able to cope with stress. And here's another side to look at stress. Interestingly enough, did you know that some stress is needed? Some stress is vitally important to our well-being. It stands to reason without some physical or mental demands, a person will settle for mediocrity and accomplish very little in life. But stress out of control becomes distress. And it's distress that robs our joy. So today I want to talk about some common causes of stress that can rob us of our joy. Number one is frustration. I'm glad I'm the only one here that suffers from that malady. When we're unable to satisfy a motive, frustration results. For example, after three years of dating, you propose and she declines. You try to borrow more money to complete the addition that you started on your house, but the loan is denied. You're promised a raise after you work with the company for six months, but they won't give it to you. Whenever a motive or need is not met, this can become extremely stressful to an individual due to frustration, and as a result, they lose their joy. The next one's conflict. Now, conflict occurs when two or more motives cannot be satisfied because they're at odds with one another. For example, 
You get a promotion with a big pay raise and better benefits, but you have to move to Colorado, and all your grandchildren live in Tennessee. Yes, that was for you, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> the doctor tells you you must lose some weight, but you love to eat, and your job is a pastry chef. Oh, that's bad. Your wife gets a job because you need the extra income, but now she's unable to spend as much time at home with you and the kids. Anytime decisions have to be made that conflict with each other, whether it's positive or negative, stress results and tries to steal our joy. The next one's pressure. The term pressure describes the stress that arises from the threat of negative events. Now, I don't know how to explain to you if you've never had a panic attack. I just, there's no way to describe it. Um, I can give you some ideas, but unless you've experienced it, you just really can't understand the depth of the impact a panic attack has on you. It's no joy ride. Now I've struggled with what they called a nervous stomach since I was a child, possibly due to the stressful home life where my mom and dad fought all the time and as a result of my dad's alcohol and drug addiction he would take me to places no child should ever go. Anyway, as an adult I'd also experienced some stressful situations like losing my job when I was the sole provider of income with three small children and coming down with pneumonia all in the same week. And then years later, I lost my job again through a buyout. And not only did I have a nervous stomach, but all of a sudden, I came down with what I later learned is called a panic attack. It's disabling. It was so severe that I could not even stand the presence of my beautiful bride in the same bedroom where I would feel like I was suffocating. Disabling. Now those of you who know anything about the story of our life know how many times that God has shown up and not only saved us or met our need, but so abundantly blessed us that we love the chance to testify of it at any time and every opportunity. Now I knew that. I knew all those things. And yet my body would not obey my will to have faith in God. And that fact that it would not obey my will was stressing me as well. I wanted to have faith in God. I wanted to give it all to God. And my body refused to allow that to happen. My joy was stolen. Let me tell you. Yet God sent me in that time two different instances of encouragement. When I first shared with Brenda the news about losing my job and my concerns about us having a place to sleep or food to eat and how we were going to provide for five children, two of which were toddlers and two of which were in college, she reached out and she cut my face in her hands and she said, I love you and I'll always be here for you even if we have to live under a bridge. Whew! What a woman. Then after a few days of staying in my room due to these panic attacks, I finally came out of my room and sat in the living room, although I had to have people sit on the other side of the room because I just couldn't stand people close to me. And nobody could touch me. And um, my teenage and young adult children came as close as they were allowed to me and said, Dad, we want to talk to you. We don't understand what's going on. We've seen you trust God through some horrific situations and we've watched as we've grown up how God has delivered us every time. We're not worried about what's going to happen and we don't want you to worry either. God's got this. We're praying for you. Hold on to your faith, Dad. We believe in you. And in the middle of that, I just burst out into tears, sobbing. I was embarrassed. I didn't want to see my children to see me cry. I didn't want to see them struggle, them see me struggling with my faith. And I tried to stop try, crying, but I could not control myself because I was emotionally and spiritually and physically drained. But my blessings gathered around me, though still at a distance, and they held hands while I cried and they prayed over me. Man, I'm blessed. You see... The pressures of negative events like I experienced are a major source of stress and joy robbers. 
Also, life events can be joy robbers. You know, things like marriage, divorce, having a baby, losing a loved one, getting promoted, getting fired, sickness, even retirement. I can't tell you how many guys I know that work with or work around who've retired and come back to me and said, i got to do something that's driving me crazy. The stress is worse than it's ever been in my life. And all these events, whether they're positive or negative, they contribute greatly to the stress in an individual. And if we don't deal with it properly, a person can begin to crumble under that stress like I did and lose the joy that God wants us to have at all times. So today... Having said all that, let's look at Paul's solution to coping with stress and maintaining our joy. First, and I want you to remember this, if you remember nothing else, is to keep our proper perspective and stop taking life on earth so seriously. Paul tells us in Philippians 4.4, 4, what did we read? Rejoice in the Lord always. And he repeated himself, and again, I say rejoice. Now, we say those words, but I'm not sure how often we really understand what he means there. Rejoice. Oh, I'm rejoicing. Did that sound like it? <laughs> or how about you think about when we were kids and we went to the pep rally before the football game? I think that's, I know that's the kind of rejoicing Paul's talking about there. Our God is Jehovah. He's on the throne. He's in control. Rejoice. Paul's saying we need to keep that perspective, that right perspective, so we can look at stressful situations like I've described and go, meh, God's got this. If you recall from the first message in this series, while he was writing these words, where was he? He was sitting in shackles. For what? For preaching Jesus. We're not talking about the mundane things like being late for work. This dude was in prison in shackles for preaching Jesus. And to compound matters, he has Christian people around him preaching Jesus Christ, not for the purpose of winning souls, but so that their reputation can be better than Paul's. And evidently, this word has gotten back to Paul and said, do you understand what these people are doing? And he's writing here. He's also, because of this, uh, some of the churches are having trouble. And in the middle of all this, we know he had at least one major health issue, some type of thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it is. So to me, he had quite a bit to be stressed about that goes way above and beyond anything I've ever experienced. And yet Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Paul was able to rejoice in spite of the frustration with those folks, the conflict that was going on, the pressure on his life, and the life events that his faith in and obedience to Jesus had thrust upon him. There was plenty in his life to steal his joy. But instead he looks at this stressful situation and says, meh, who cares? Nothing's going to rob me of my joy. I know who I serve. Philippians 1.18, Paul replies to this report that people are preaching against him and preaching for Christ solely for their own glory. And he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. He looked through the situation to the overall purpose and he said even if they're doing it for the wrong reason, people who had never heard of Jesus Christ are hearing about Jesus Christ and for that I praise the Lord. Amen. He had the right perspective. So perspective is huge in our ability to be able to maintain our joy in the middle of our stress. Paul kept his perspective and as a result was able to rejoice that Christ was being proclaimed regardless of their motive behind it. In Proverbs 17, it says, A cheerful heart is like good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And what he's saying here is when we allow stress to steal our joy, we can get so down that it sucks the very life out of us. 
and it also sucks the life of those around us and everyone we come in contact with. But when we have the right perspective and face life with a cheerful heart, what the Word says here, we're like good medicine that cures both our own soul and, again, those that are around us. Have you ever had somebody that affected you that way? He said, man, I love to be around Brother Estel. Every time I come away, I am just so filled with happiness and joy. He just he makes life look so much better. I'm so glad I get to spend time with him. You ever had somebody like that? Sure. That's what he's saying here. When you keep your joy, you not only benefit yourself, but you benefit those around you. And when you allow your joy to be stolen, it not only sucks the life out of you, but it sucks the life of those around you. That's why it's so critical that we cling to our joy and refuse to allow it to be stolen by this character called stress. So which do you have? Do you have a cheerful heart or a crushed spirit? If you have a crushed spirit and you're down and depressed all the time, then I would challenge you that you need a new perspective. Then with that new perspective, you need to learn how to lighten up and start enjoying life. Yes, life in this world can be tough, but we have guaranteed victory in Jesus. Christ is our medicine, amen? He gives us a cheerful heart. He's the one who cures us of a crushed spirit caused by our incorrect perspective and what ends up resulting in our own self-pity. That's where we end up. When our joy is stolen, the end result is we end up in self-pity. So one way to overcome the negative effects of stress and anxiety is to laugh more often. You know, I've got a good friend of mine. haven't seen him in many years now. Melvin Johnson. And when he used to come over, he, he's one of my cheerful heart guys that really just pumps me up. We had a little game that his children and our children always played when we got together after supper, which was not, in retrospect, not always the best time, but right after supper, we always wanted to play the laughing game. And it was simply to see how many different types of laughs we could make. And it sounds silly, and it was silly. But you know what I found? It was like dessert for the soul. Because when we got done playing that game, no matter what life situation we're in, you were just almost refreshed because you had laughed. So there's a lot in this world to keep us from laughing, and we need to laugh more often. God created that ability for us to laugh, and we don't use it, and as a result, we suffer for it. So we need to look for things to do that make you laugh, like reading my pun post on Facebook every day. I don't know. I knew that was going to get a groan. Watch a comedy. Or here's one of my favorites. Google some funny cat videos on YouTube. And then start laughing a lot. And then you need to repent. Because so many times I find that when I'm stressed out, when I'm anxious, it's because I have tried to control my life instead of allowing God to have control of my life. I've told God that he's not enough. That I must take control. So for us to have joy, we must repent and give our life back to God. And repent is not just saying, I'm sorry, Lord, I did it again. As we learned several Sabbaths ago, what is repenting? It's admitting what you did wrong. It's apologizing for what you did wrong. It's forgiving, asking for forgiveness for what you did wrong. And then it's not doing again what you did wrong. We need to repent and truly give our cares to Jesus. That's why in Philippians 4 verses 6 through 7, Paul reminds them, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And what's the result of when we obey this? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So if a joy robber is coming, we need to guard, right? 
And Paul gives us the answer right here. How do we guard our hearts? By getting God's peace. And how do we get God's peace? In everything, give it to God. Don't just tell Him about it. Give it to Him. This is yours, God. I can't do anything about it. You handle it. Oh, oh that's right. You're God anyway. <laughs> we forget that sometimes. Tell me I'm wrong. We need to learn some songs like give it all to Jesus. Cast all my cares upon him. Ah, Lord God. And so on. And sing them to remind yourself of the stressful situations in life need to be given over to God and let him handle them. This is how Paul was able to rejoice in spite of this stressful situation he was in. Because he'd already turned it over to God in prayer. He said, here you go, God. You handle all that mess. And I'm just going to praise God that your name's being preached. Because you know what? He didn't have control over all that either. And he knew it. So he kept the right perspective and as a result kept his joy. Unfortunately, too many of us in life, we approach life with the thought of why pray when you can worry? Why pray when you can worry? They ignore these directives in Scripture like we just read. They ignore 1 Peter 5, 7, which Peter says, Cast all your anxiety, your cares on Him, for He cares for you. It's like God is standing here going, Give it to me. I can handle this, Brother Bill. Just hand it to me. If you'll give it to me, I'll fix it in a way that will blow your mind. I'll resolve that situation. I'll heal that situation in a way that you could never hope to have done. But instead, we'd rather worry and natter over it and try to figure it out on our own. It's crazy when you think of it like that. The psalmist in chapter 55, verse 22 says, Cast all your cares on the Lord and He will sustain you. He will never let the righteous fail. Have you ever claimed that promise in the midst of losing my job? I have to admit, I did not claim the fact that God will never let the righteous fall. I know it sounds simplistic, but the greatest means to prevent stress and anxiety from robbing your joy is talking to God about it in prayer and comparing the situation to God's Word. Put it in the proper perspective. The fact that we have a promise of eternal life. That we have a God who loves us. Not only so much that He created us, but then when we screwed it up, loved us enough to take on the form of man and die on the cross for us. He cares for you. So every time you feel stressed out about your job, your children, your spouse, the bills, the church, stop where you are and spend a few minutes fervently praying to God about it. I'll guarantee you that by the end of that sincere and focused prayer, not just a Hail Mary, Oh God, help me! You'll feel an amazing peace. And you will defeat stress from robbing you of your joy. The next way to defeat stress is dwell on the good in your life. I walked into work Thursday morning with a guy who when I asked him how he was doing, he gave me a less than positive answer. Despite the beautiful sunrise and weather we were enjoying as we walked across the parking lot. So I said, stop a minute. Can I, can I say a few things to you? Okay. And I reminded him. You just got your third degree. You got your bachelor's, then your doctorate. Now you've gone back and you've accomplished your MBA. You've got a successful wife who loves you and adores you. You've got this beautiful five, six-year-old daughter that's doing really well in school. She's just the prettiest thing you ever saw. You've got this job. You've got all your staff love you. You woke up on the right side of dirt this morning for crying out loud. How can you be anything but having a wonderful day? His eyes got a little watery and he said, Thank you. Thank you for helping me get the right perspective. I know I'm going to have a better day because you did that. Getting and maintaining the right perspective is what Paul is directing the church at Philippi to do in Philippians 4 and verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, 
whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence or anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Get your perspective right and put your mind where it belongs. Paul says, focus our attention, focus our mind, get our perspective on the positive things, not the negative. Now, before you protest, yes, you could interpret that to think Paul is promoting the power of positive thinking. But it's so much more than that. You see, proponents of Norman Vincent Peale's power of positive thinking tell you to attempt to deny the negative as though it doesn't exist and instead focus solely on the positive. But Paul's not asking us to deny the bad things. We read in chapter 1 where he had listed all the bad things going on. What he's saying is, don't dwell on the negative all the time. Instead, we must refocus our minds onto the beneficial, not the stressful things. We must fix our concentration on things above, not on things on earth. We must concentrate on the peaceful things, not the worrisome ones. We must dwell on the tranquil things, not the fretful. We must get and maintain the right perspective and ask ourselves, what are the things in our life that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy? Let's review a few of them with me. We serve the Almighty God, the Lord of all creation, the Omnipotent One. Hallelujah. We know in whom we have believed. We know that He's able we have a hope that is based on faith in Christ Jesus and the redemptive work on the cross. We don't have to do it in our own strength. He did that which we could not and gave us the Holy Spirit to finish the work. Hallelujah! If that's not a reason to rejoice, what is, people? Why are we here? We have promises based on God's unchanging integrity and power. We have a peace that is based on God's presence in our heart and His work in our lives. And the one that I cling to so often is we have an assurance of His unfailing grace. Hallelujah. And we have things that last for eternity and are stored up in heaven for us based on God's dependability. And these are the things that get us through life in spite of the stressful situations we face. Do we live in a stressful time, folks? Sure we do. In prayer time, we heard about several things that could stress us a lot, didn't we? And as Christians, are we under attack? Yes, we are. All across the world and ever more so in America each day. And then we have to complicate things, the advent of technology. And as a result, we're multitasking, always connected, so that we rarely ever truly have downtime, which makes the Sabbath rest all that much more important. Lots of life events, both good and bad, occur to try to rob us of our joy. But folks, we have the power available to us that keeps us from crumbling underneath that stress. And this is why Paul, regardless of the stressful circumstances he finds himself in, is able to state in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Many people misinterpret that verse. They don't read the entire passage. You have to read from chapter 1 to that verse. He has covered all the horrific circumstances and conditions that are going on in his life, both being rich and poor, hungry and full. And he says, regardless of the circumstances my life is in, regardless of the stress and the people that are causing problems, regardless of what I've done in the past, killing so many Christians, regardless of all that, I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He knew in whom he believed. Folks, today we must maintain our perspective on order in order to defeat stress from robbing us of our joy in Christ. And Paul is telling us here that it's Christ who gives us the strength we need to deal with and overcome our frustrations, our conflicts, our pressures and difficulties in life. And because of this, and when we walk with that perspective, we're able to rejoice in the Lord always. So what about you? Has stress been robbing your joy? And if so, why did you let it happen? Why do you let it happen? And what are you going to do about it? Don't do it, church. Guard your joy. 
Face the stresses that would rob your joy the way that Paul did. Reason the situation through the lens of God's Word and put it in its proper perspective. Remember the freedom we have from sin and the resulting joy we have through the redemptive work of Christ. Focus instead on the positive things and keep the right perspective. May God bless and empower you to accomplish this. Amen. Do we have